Hello. Hi. <laughs> nice participation already. Um, my name's Fiona. I'm a developer and also a consultant with a company called ThoughtWorks. Uh, and today, what I want to have a chat about is the social implications of bias in machine learning. Now, there's a fair few words there, and I think some of them might need defining before we start. So firstly, I want to be really clear about what I mean when I say bias in this context. So when I say bias here, I'm talking about a social bias. I'm not, I'm not talking about statistical bias. Now, I think that's really important to call out because when we read about statistics and machine learning, we come across this statistical bias a lot, and it's also really important. But that just isn't what I'm discussing now. What I want to talk about is prejudice, whether that's a conscious or an unconscious prejudice. That's the kind of bias I mean. Just some kind of negative thought process or pattern about a, a group of people based on some kind of protected attribute like race or gender or age. So to be clear about the thing we're not talking about, statistical bias, what's that? Um, so that is when we want to use some measure of something from the real world in some kind of calculation. So we take a bunch of, a bunch of um, measurements of that thing, we average them out, and then the difference between that and the thing we were actually trying to measure, that's an example of statistical bias. But don't worry, we're not talking about that, which is great, because it means we get to have a chat now about the human condition rather than just hear about maths. Now, I don't want to imply that bias is this horrible thing we have to completely eradicate because really we kind of need it. There is just so much information all of the time all around us. If we want to make decisions, we do sometimes have to make generalizations and shortcuts. And this is okay, so long as those aren't going to reinforce some really negative thing that, that we don't want to proliferate. So the other thing we should really mention up front is what is machine learning? I just want to get an idea who here is already working with machine learning uh, as part of their everyday. Can I get an idea? Okay, so we have a couple of people, a few maybe. Great. And who's already like really comfortable with this definition? They feel like they already really understand what machine learning is. Cool. Okay. A, a big group. So. For the people who, who didn't feel comfortable to raise their hand, I just want to quickly go through a definition that will suffice for this talk. So when I talk about machine learning here, I'm going to use these terms algorithms and statistical models basically interchangeably. Uh, I'm going to consider those to be the same in this context. But what I'm really talking about is computer systems that perform a specific task, so not generalized AI, and they do so without explicit instruction. So this is also not just a bunch of if-else statements that someone's calling ML. It's, it's actually something based on patterns of inference. So to, to go a little further into this definition, this is a situation where we might have some kind of question, and we've got some data pertaining to that question. So we take the majority of that data and we train a model, and then with the remaining data we can test to see if that model actually answers that question. For example, if I want the question is, what is the likelihood of us hiring this candidate? Maybe I would have some data about past candidates. What was their resume? What was the hiring outcome? Did they succeed within the organization? And then I will train some kind of model based on the correlation between those things and test it based on who was actually hired and what the model thought would be the person hired. So for a slightly more fun example, something using image recognition. So these are pictures that I took of cats. Um, I had to find these to include them in the talk, and so I was just like looking through my Google Photos library, where are some pictures of cats, and I was thinking about the experiences I've had with cats. So they're quite fluffy, you know, um, they're often inside, they have about this many limbs, these kinds of things. And this was helping me to try and identify the photos. But I got super bored of this. This was really tedious. So I just typed cats into the search bar, and these popped up. But how did Google manage that? Well, surely this algorithm has no experience of petting cats, so it can't do the same thing I was doing. 
all it has access to is this 2D array of pixels. So I wasn't in the team developing this, but I can guess it looks something like this. There would be some huge data set, some cats, some not cats, and these would have been fed in to train a model. But what I find interesting about this is if I was to approach the team who had developed this, I'm sure they couldn't tell me. In that third level of processing, the, the second pixel from the bottom on the left, how much does that impact whether this is an image of a cat or not? They probably can't tell me because it's basically a black box. But this is where some of the power comes from. Because if I tried to remember cats and think of some algorithm and write it with code myself, there's no way I could have come up with something as powerful as what we can do when we allow machines to find inferences. But this does give us kind of a trade-off. So it's not quite as direct as I, I make it seem here, but there is the ability for us to pick algorithms that are much more accurate, but much harder for us to really grasp or, or to do anything to reproduce so that we can test them. And then on the other side, we can have much simpler algorithms that we can really reason about, but that might not have the results we're looking for. OK, so how's this talk going to go down? Well, I'd like to take you on a journey through from the beginning of all these things, data and its collection, through its processing, the generation of models, and also how these products are used in the real world. And at each step, I want to go through some examples from the real world, some potential risks we might want to look out for, and recommend helpful tools. So I know that that's a lot, and we should probably get started. Uh, what I've also compiled is a list of all of my references and resources about this, and on the very last slide, I will show that. So don't worry if you don't manage to note down exactly what that tool or that, or that thing was. They will all be there at the end. Cool. So let's get started. And let's start where any good ML project starts, with the purposeful collection of data. Now, we probably all have a huge lake of data just sitting somewhere back at the office that we could tap into and get started with. But was this data really collected with our question in mind? And what if it wasn't? Exactly who we are and when we look and what we choose to look at and what questions we ask really impacts the data that we end up with. So there is really an inherent bias to anything that we measure. For one example, the city of Boston had this problem where there were a lot of potholes around the city and they wanted to fix those that were the most impactful first. They didn't even know where the potholes were. So what they did, like any modern city, is they made an app. And this app was pretty cool. So you just put it in the passenger seat and it uses the accelerometer in the phone to tell when you've gone over a pothole and how extreme that pothole was. And then it uses the GPS to track the location that pothole was. It's awesome. But the team who was working on this, they looked at the data and they were a little bit confused. Like, why is it mostly these really wealthy suburbs that seem to have all of the really bad potholes? And so that's when they thought, OK, what if we add the same app into public buses and garbage trucks? Suddenly, all these other potholes started coming up, ones that were really more impactful and really needed to be fixed. I think this is a great example of how the data doesn't speak for itself as much as we claim it does. It really does echo its collectors. Another example of this is if I was to ask you about your earnings. But let's say I did this with the hat of the tax office on. Or let's say a different hat, I was someone who you're on a second date with. Or maybe I'm someone who is a friend of yours who's going through some kind of financial hardship. Do you think you might paint a slightly different picture based on which hat I was wearing when I asked you that question? Just another example. So I really like this quote in the context of this. Data being raw, this concept is, is not just false, but it's really dangerous as well. Because we know that how we measure something will impact what we see, we should really be really careful about how we bring that data to be not raw. Something common which we talk about in ML uh, is the concept of 
garbage in, garbage out. Like if your data is bad, then your model would be bad. I think we can do the same with bias in, bias out. So one tool that can be useful for this is the Open Data Institute's Data Ethics Canvas. So it's probably not readable from here, but you can check the reference list later. They've got a whole bunch of questions in these circles for us to ask ourselves or our teams about how data is being collected and how it's being used. So two examples I want to call out. There's one about the negative effects on people. It specifically asks questions about, could, could this cause harm? Could this, this data that we're collecting and using be used to target or to profile people or to prejudice or to unfairly restrict access? Or could it be seen to do any of these things? Because sometimes perception is reality. There's also some questions about minimizing the negative impacts. It specifically focuses around, can we measure the impact of this so that we can then pivot if we discover that something isn't what we expected. So to summarize this section, we need to be careful of the data that we collect because it will all have some bias. This is another reason why we need to be skeptical of that data that we already have, as easy as it might seem to just use that. And we can use both the Data Institute's Data Ethics Canvas and also Ethical OS have a toolkit with some um, great questions as well. So we've collected our data, we've been really careful, but maybe there's something there we should just throw away. This might seem, it's crazy, right? You want to have more data. The more you have, the more accurate your result will be. I'd really like to question that. Starting with a story about, about orchestras. So historically, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, it was really only men who had access to education, particularly time, leisure time to learn instruments, all of this kind of stuff. So of course, most orchestras were mostly guys. Made sense. But what was observed was that audition-only orchestras, even recently, were still mostly men, even though there was a lot of a lot of women learning instruments, so it, it didn't really make a lot of sense. So what one orchestra decided to do was during their auditions, they would simply close the curtain so that the people judging couldn't tell the gender of the person playing the instrument. And they thought, yeah, this will really help. Removing this visual data will solve that problem. Unfortunately, it didn't. And it wasn't until they decided to remove the shoes of the people that suddenly women could play instruments. It was the clip-clap, clip-clap of the shoes going across the stage that had already put somewhere in the mind of the judge, oh, it's a woman who's going to play this instrument. And they probably don't have a conscious bias, but historically men played instruments. So it was when they removed this data that suddenly they had better results. They had the better musician. Sometimes we can increase the accuracy by removing data that's only confusing us. All of these are considered protected attributes in my home country of Australia. None of these can legally be used for any hiring decisions. Nothing around promotion or firing or hiring can legally use these as factors. What's cool is you're not also legally allowed to use proxies to these values. What do I mean by a proxy in this case? I mean, like if I knew the high school of someone, then I could know their gender maybe, or probably their nationality is easy to guess. But even that stuff can't be used. And the GDPR have some similar suggestions, and it ends up being that most EU countries have these kinds of, um, these kinds of laws. So, sorry, not GDPR, but there's another law which also protects these attributes from any kind of hiring decision, which makes sense to me. But what if we're building tools like the one I gave in the example, where we try to help companies find the best person for the job using something like ML? Can we make sure that we are eliminating these factors? Well, I think we can do it better than recruiters can, because if we've actually just not fed this data into the algorithm to begin with, then it doesn't know. Whereas a recruiter might have to ignore them, the machine learning algorithm could potentially actually not know them, and that's hugely powerful. So sometimes we have to let go 
of the data that we have, just a bit of it, even though it sounds less impressive. So there are some legal constraints, depending on jurisdiction, for how certain data can and can't be used. We can sometimes reduce data to increase the accuracy of our outcomes. And even though forgetting is really hard for us, it's easier for machines. So we can use that to our advantage. The third part in my three-part series on data is the adding of missing data. Again, this might come across as strange. So if we were really careful in our collection and we just saw what we saw, how could something be missed? It doesn't quite make sense. I think an example will help. So I think the way we raise machines is kind of similar to the way we raise people. We're not raising them for the now, and we're not raising them really based on the past, but we're raising them to be some kind of force in the future. We want whatever they're learning to apply in the time when they will exist in the world, which is, isn't right now, it's later. And so if we only use historical data, then we won't really have good, good predictions about what the future holds. For instance, if, if maybe our child is sick, right, and we want to take them to the doctor, we would probably say, let's go to the doctor and see what they think. We probably wouldn't anymore say, let's go to the doctor and see what he thinks, unless we were talking about a specific male doctor, because this might confuse this child. They might think, as, as the daughter, that they aren't able to be a doctor. A more tech example, we have Google Translate, and you can play along, if you like, on your phone. Um, this is my profile. You can see up there my photo. And what I've done is I've picked the language Malay, and I've picked this for a reason, because Malay has this, this kind of cool words which mean they are. And so I've written some things in Malay. They are a, whatever the, the job title is. These are all job titles. Does anybody have guesses as to what some of these might translate to? Probably based on the inclusion in this talk, we can guess some certain things. OK, let's have a look. So yeah, Google Translate thought probably he would be a doctor and she would be a nurse. But I totally get this. This makes sense as the outcome. Because let's say we were trying to help train this algorithm. We would probably get what is all of the data we have in Malay and in English, all of the things that we have translations for, throw them into some kind of algorithm, and then bam, we have this, probably. Because there would there would definitely be more examples of him being a doctor if we're looking at historical data. But what we would hope is that we would notice this and realize that this is really reinforcing some historical patterns that we might not want to reinforce and which might even not be true anymore. So what's cool is for some languages, Google have started to fix this. So now for Turkish, at least, we have the same statement they are a doctor. They also have gender neutral kind of way of saying this in Turkish. And now we've got two options. And Google have even released something saying that they plan to make this work beyond the gender binary as well. So that's cool. And the reason this is important is because this is a translator, so it should be accurate. But also, we have, we've basically achieved gender parity across doctors. Like, this is not even accurate for now anymore. So someone else I want to introduce you to, her name is Joy. She started something called the Algorithmic Justice League. Uh, the reason she started this group is because she is a researcher at MIT Media Lab, and she did her master's thesis about how facial recognition software, specifically recognition software from Face++ and IBM and, and Microsoft's equivalent offerings, she found that it was nowhere near as effective at recognizing the faces of women of color. And she first did this research because she'd noticed it on herself when she was doing some art project using facial recognition. I'd like to share with you her experience. The system I was using worked well on my lighter skinned friend's face, but when it came to detecting my face, it didn't do so well until I put on a white mask. So I think this is a really great example of a product not being fit for purpose, unless it has the data that's clearly missing. 
Something that Joy talks a lot about in her advocacy work is she says that diversity in teams can really help with noticing who's missing. We didn't really need more arguments for diversity in teams. Um, they already have been shown through research to have better financial results and better decision making. But in case we needed one more reason, here's another one. But if for some reason that's impossible, even just expanding the people who we consider to be impacted by our systems or who we consider our users to be can really help. So one tool that made it onto the technology radar by ThoughtWorks, uh, in the last one I think, is this. So this is the tarot cards of tech. And I want to call out one of these cards in particular, which is called The Forgotten. This card encourages us to consider who are the people who might be in our user base who we haven't considered? Who might this product exclude? One question I really like in this space is, who might give our product a one-star review and why? Because if we can think of this before the product is out there getting these reviews, we might be able to stop them before they even start. Another tool, Google's Pair Initiative, their People Plus AI Research. They have this, which is Facets and also Facets Dive, which helps you to analyze your data to see who is better or worse represented in that data set. So for instance, here we can see this data set, which is the UCI Census Income data set, really well represents professional white married men, which is awesome. If we want to make predictions about this group, we can probably get some really accurate predictions. But if, say, we wanted to use this data set to make predictions about a wider audience, then we can see really clearly on the right here what are the groups that we might be underrepresenting? So where is it that we need to look for that missing data? So sometimes our products are not fit for purpose without, miss without finding the missing data. Diverse teams, or at least a diverse perspective on who will be impacted by our products can be helpful. And Google, they have a couple of tools, though I admit you do need to upload your data um, to a web UI for at least one of them. So we talked earlier about this black box and this concept of trading off between observability and accuracy. I want to touch on that in the context of being able to explain our models. So a part of the GDPR has this really cool sentence which is being known as the right to an explanation in more casual circles. I'll show it to you now. So this is about the, the data subject and they say that the data subject has the right to know the existence of automated decision making. But not only that, they also need meaningful information about the logic involved. So this means we have to open the black box. If we're going to explain why a choice was made about someone, we need to know ourselves why. And even better, it also asks for some kind of context around the envisioned consequences of that decision, which I think is brilliant. It means we in our teams need to actually consider the people and the impacts these decisions are likely to make. So we need to open the black box. And I don't want to do this by simplifying our algorithms. I don't want to give up any sort of accuracy in doing this. And I also don't want to do it because it was regulated. Remember those times when you had a bug, right? And you weren't really sure what was causing this bug. And you did something, and it seems to work now, so probably you fixed it, but you don't really know. If you've had these experiences, in those times, did you really think you fixed it? Probably that bug's going to come back, right? Definitely in my case it did. And I think that's because we didn't fully understand what was actually going on. So the same in ML. If we don't really know why our model tests well, does it really? And does it do it for the right reasons? One tool that can help us with this is Lime. So Lime is a Python library that came out of a research paper. So if you like pip installing things, this could be a fun one to try. It stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. Ugh, that's quite a mouthful. Let me try and explain it from the bottom up. So explanations, that's what we want. We want to know why things are the way they are. Model agnostic, this is really cool. So it doesn't matter if you're using support vector machine, are you using a neural network, is it a random forest, who cares? This tool works, which is exciting. 
It's interpretable, as in we, the humans, can understand what's happening, and local, local to the area the decision is made. It's probably still unclear. I'll use the example that Lyme used. So this is a picture of a tree frog, or it has a p-value of 0.54 that it's a tree frog. But why? Why did the algorithm think this was a tree frog? We can kind of guess, but if we want to know, we can use Lyme to generate hundreds of thousands of different varieties of this image. And they've just taken some of the pixels away. And they run those through the same algorithm and find out how much were they likely to be a tree frog. And as I said, this doesn't just work for pictures. This could be some kind of big set of key value pairs, some, some huge data set, and we've just taken some of the data away. And then we can get an idea of where exactly it is and what exact part of this image gave us tree frog as the result. And it was that, it was the face. But we couldn't have known that. So I think this is amazing. But if it's too much Python, there's also the what if tool by Google. And this does involve, again, uploading data onto a, a browser, but it doesn't involve very much coding at all. So it's a trade-off. But something I find cool about this is it's just another example of how sometimes these automated decisions can actually be better than human ones. Because if someone makes a decision, you don't really know why they made that decision. Even if we ourselves make choices, we struggle sometimes to tell if it's just a post hoc justification or the real reason we'd made that choice. But with a tool like this, with the visibility we can get, we might actually know why and be able to judge truly was it fair or not. So in order to trust, we need to know why something works, not just that it works. Lime can help us in opening the black box and a couple of other tools, including one by IBM, their AI Fairness 360 toolkit also has an implementation of Lime and some other similar kinds of tools. That one's cool to check out as well. Just briefly, I'd like to touch upon feedback loops. So by a feedback loop, what I mean is when something that, that our algorithms suggest about the world becomes a decision or an outcome. And then that outcome impacts the world, which we then measure for the next algorithm that we train. To make it clearer, I'll use an example. So Facebook recently came under fire for so many things, but one of the things that Facebook recently came under fire for was the way its ad platform selects the people who will see ads. So when you go to publish an ad on Facebook, you can specify some things about who you want to see it, but you can't get too granular. And what you then see is really quite granular detail about the demographics of the people who were shown your ad. And what people noticed was, if they put up job advertisements for things like cleaning or secretarial work, even if they didn't specify they wanted to show this to more women, that's who ended up seeing the ad. And it was the same for really high-paid jobs and people of colour who were much less likely to see those ads. So though Facebook boasts about their ad algorithm showing it, these ads to people who are more receptive, I would question whether this is one of those feedback loops. Because if we observe in the world, these people are the people doing these jobs, and we use this to create a model to predict who we think might be interested in those jobs, and that causes a, deci a decision like who sees an ad and who goes into the interview room, then we impact who works in that field and we just keep reinforcing the same thing. So unless we, unless we remove the bias, we are just automating it. The same thing is happening in the US in the way that bail is determined. There is a tool called Compass that an organization called ProPublica found to be extremely biased. So when we're tweaking models and training them, we're looking to avoid the main two, the failure cases, right? The false positives and false negatives. So we've got two false positive and false negative cases here for bail determination. We've got, all right, we think they're pretty high risk to reoffend, but actually they didn't. So we accidentally kept them in prison longer or put a high bail. Or they're labeled low risk, but actually they reoffended. So then we're not rehabilitating people enough. So these are two sort of problematic groups that we want to reduce the amount of when we're training models.
And what they found was that for white people, this was the distribution within those two failure cases. And it won't equal 100, because sometimes they get it right. And in the other case, for African Americans, it swaps. So there's a pretty clear bias here. And yet this tool is still being used. I wanted to try and find some kind of silver lining here. The most I could come up with was that juries aren't perfect either, and judges sometimes make mistakes. So maybe at least if we have something that we can really control, like a machine, we could have these kinds of feedback loops working in directions that we want to change. But I haven't seen that happening yet. So today's outputs are tomorrow's inputs. And we need to think about how that's going to impact what, what we'll see in the world down the track and what data we're going to read next time. Lastly, I want to touch upon governance and usage. So this is when our products are being released into the world, when they stop just being that shiny, pretty code on the screen and become something that changes people's lives. Last year, Amazon had a lot of really clickbaity titles about them. So there was these titles saying, 28 members of the US Congress matched to mugshots. Uh, and so the Amazon representative made a comment about this, and they said this was not a fair test. They said we should not be using the default 80% threshold for confidence when comparing people to mugshot photos, which I agree with. That sounds really low. But if that's the default, and this software is sold to law enforcement. I hope that's not the default when they sell it to law enforcement. So what ended up happening was some jurisdictions just banned this outright. And Microsoft requested, please, can we be regulated? When a company or, or an industry is asking for regulation, then you know something might be up. But really, whose responsibility is this? I honestly don't know. Is it us as consumers? Is it us as technologists? Do we need to take some kind of oath? Is that even going to help? Do we need to rely on, on governments to create laws against this and somehow keep up with ever-changing technology as they regulate? Do we just need to trust organizations to somehow be ethical or rely on the media to find these things like ProPublica did and bring them out into the light? That didn't really help either. People are still using Compass. So who's responsible and who's going to change this? This is something I'd really like to discuss. I don't know. But I think what we can do is learn from other industries. The ones that came before us, who already made the embarrassing mistakes. One example of that is pharmaceutical. So the pharmaceutical industry, if I go and pick some, some tablet off the shelf in a pharmacy, I'm going to get basic information about that product. I'm going to know what actually is it capable of and not capable of. It's going to tell me what is the active ingredient, the magic that makes it work. How do I use it? When should I not use it? It'll have some safety features like this cool cap to stop my children overdosing. And they're going to recall this product if they find out it's actually harmful. Can we not do all of these things as well in tech, especially in ML? when these things are not obvious to our users. Because they assume, like we sometimes do too, that computers are somehow not fallible. But they totally are. They're really logical, but they're built by humans. And humans make mistakes. An organization in this space who did something really cool recently is OpenAI. So OpenAI, as you'd imagine from the name, they do like AI stuff and then they open it up. But what they did was they did AI stuff and then they didn't open it up. And here's the reason. So they had worked out how to make really believable text that reads as if a human wrote it, which is cool. It cost them a lot of money and they were really proud of what they'd made. But they took a step back and thought about it and realized that this technology, especially paired with something like deep fakes, which allows people to make really believable images of people who don't necessarily exist, could actually be really harmful and scary. Because if we've got believable text, believable faces, all being generated by machines, how do we even know what's real anymore? We just wouldn't. And so what they did was they didn't release the dangerous thing. 
Instead, they made a really cut down version and they started a conversation about the risks. And I think this is brilliant because I too would much rather be known as the person who didn't release the harmful thing. Another advantage we have in IT over most other industries and over humans is that we can really quickly patch, assuming that we have good CICD, we can quickly get some change into production or quickly toggle something off to recall it if we find that what we've created was actually causing harm. And I don't think we take this advantage enough. If I want to change a product, I've got to make a, a physical recall of products. That's difficult. If I want to impact society, I need to like build my own human, push them out, raise them well, and then dump them in society. That takes time. But with machines, we can really do this a lot quicker. So let's take that to our advantage. So how can we inform users, warn them and restrict them? have sensible defaults, not like 80% on facial recognition? Can we all demand better products, not just as users, but also as technologists? And unlike humans or things in the physical world, we can create updates very quickly if we discover something is harmful. To summarize everything that I've just talked about, we realize that data is biased by the way it's collected. And so instead of just finding the potholes in rich suburbs, let's be really conscious of this, potentially using the Open Data Institute's Data Ethics Canvas to consider how we're collecting this data. We have the power to only show our machines what we want them to see. So we can create things that are much fairer by closing the curtain and removing the shoes in contexts other than just auditions for orchestras. Diversity in teams, or at least diversity in who we consider our users to be, can help us to not forget the data that we've missed. And then maybe we can realize that not only he is a doctor and create products that can see Joy's face. Let's use Lime to open the black box to see what it really is that we've created and how it works not just for ourselves and our regulators, but for our users. Let's be conscious of those feedback loops that we will inherently create and make sure that they are encouraging us in a direction we want to go. Let's learn from other industries that have been around hundreds of years and made lots of embarrassing mistakes and try to take on what they've learned and apply it in our context too. Because I'd like to leave you with this. Everyone here in the room is a technologist. And I think we realize that we have an immense power to change and shape society. What I really hope is that after this, we also have a couple of ideas about how we can make that a positive impact. Happy to take questions now, or if you prefer one-on-one -on -one later on. Um, and this is that link to the references that I mentioned earlier. And a couple of book recommendations if this was not enough on this topic for you. Thanks so much.